What's going on guys? Thank you so much for being here. So today's video is gonna be a little bit about the sauce of fishing. The noodles are like the main part of the pasta, right? The pasta dish. The sauce is like all the things that make it all come together. One of the things I have to do as a flathead fisherman, literally every single time that I go out fishing, is I have to study bait laws. I have to know what they are, I have to know what they mean, and I have to know where I'm getting close to that line, right? So every bait that I use, uh, the banks that I fish, all that stuff, that's all gotta be taken into account. How many rods I can have out at one time. So recently I made a poll asking you guys, basically if any of you have ever been ticketed, have you ever been arrested? Do any of you know somebody that's had some of these things? Have you ever been issued a written or verbal warning by a CEO or a Department of Natural Resources person? About half of you said no, and the other half of you said yes. So I decided to go ahead and make a video about it. All the things that I have to take into account as a flathead fisherman. Now, I'm, a lot of this stuff is gonna be straight off of my state's website. I live in Indiana. A lot of states either follow suit or Indiana follows suit, whatever. They're all kind of sort of hybrids of the same law. The first one we're gonna talk about today is navigable waterways. So this is probably a toss up between this one and bait laws that I know more about than any other laws. Uh, I have to study these, these laws specifically very well to know exactly uh, whether or not I'm within the bounds of legality or not, right? So navigable waterways, what does it mean? Navigability, property rights relative to Indiana waterways often are determined by whether the waterway is navigable. Both common law and statutory law make distinctions founded upon whether a river, stream, embayment, or lake is navigable. A landmark decision in Indiana with respect to determining and applying navigability in state versus Kivet. The Indiana Supreme Court stated that the test for determining navigability is whether a waterway was available and susceptible for navigation according to the general rules of river transportation at the time of 1816, Indiana was admitted to the Union. It does not depend on whether it is now navigable. The true test seems to be the capacity of the stream rather than the manner or extent of use and the mere fact that the presence of sandbars or driftwood or stone or other objects which at times render the stream unfit for transportation does not destroy its actual capacity and susceptibility for that use. So that's a lot to unpack right there but it's really it's actually pretty cut and dry. Every state's going to have certain waterways that are deemed navigable right and, and according to my state once a waterway is deemed navigable it cannot be unnavigable right it, it cannot for any reason uh, be altered either naturally or man-made to cause it to be unnavigable all of them that are navigable today will be navigable in 100 years from now uh, so basically a lot of your states are going to have uh, lists of navigable waterways mine does if i have a picture of it i'll show it here right now in my particular county there's only two uh, but they're really like almost every single small creek that you know of that you maybe wade fish or something somewhere along the line be becomes a navigable waterway the closer it gets down to its main tributary right so basically it's all defined by the high water mark and what is the high water mark well in some states are defined differently uh, when i talk to ceos specifically this is not something that they deal with tremendously but they do run into it and it's usually like one landowner along a body of water who wants to prosecute every single person that you know steps foot on their ground and and i understand that from a, a private property perspective but the reality is people just really need to, to pay attention to the waterways that they're on and the high water mark is generally defined as basically you just look at the bank and see where the water typically comes up to and you just have to stay within the confines of that so like on a uh, on the river that i fish like a sandbar for example that's all public property right uh, rock bars things like that those are all public properties so what happens when you find yourself in a non-navigable waterway so basically you can touch the water and nothing else right so like if you throw a lure out and it literally lands on the bottom if i'm catfishing and i, lo I throw a, a bait out i'm in a boat and i throw a bait out and it lands on the bottom technically i'm trespassing because the bottom is owned privately in a non-navigable waterway now there's a lot more that goes into that 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 law really delves into but that's more like water rights and public access versus private ownership access in terms of like aggregate and, and the case study that they mentioned here uh, that was actually a, that was something between a company uh, trying to pull aggregate sand I think or, or some type of rock out of a creek bed and uh, that's how that law came into effect here in the state of Indiana and almost every single one of your states will have some kind of case law that, that really like 
creates like a landmark decision for how that law gets written. So make sure you know your navigable waterways. I looked into Texas. I looked into a bunch of them, but Texas, holy crap. Texas's navigable waterway law is ridiculous, right? There's actually two uh, definitions of a navigable waterway there. It's like navigable by fact and navigable by, I don't know, reality. I don't even know. Like, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Uh, but a lot of them are really different, so make sure you know your state's navigable waterway laws. Bag limits and possession limits. What is a bag limit? So a bag limit is basically uh, the amount of fish you're allowed to keep in a day. Wild caught fish caught in an open season day, like an open calendar day. So if the bag limit on, I don't know, crappies in, in my state is like 25, you obviously can't keep any more than 25 for that day. No matter where you go in the state, once you've caught your 25 under the sun of Indiana, you can no longer fish for them and keep them. The, the bag limit on flathead catfish, again, doesn't really affect me because I don't really keep them. Uh, but if I was going to, and some of you guys do, so basically the bag limit is you can keep one flathead over 35 inches in the state of Indiana in a river. Also in a river, there is actually a minimum size limit. There, there is a minimum size requirement uh, here in the state of Indiana for all catfish and it's 13 inches. And But there is no number limit under 35 inches. Between 35 inches and 13 inches, there is no number limit. You can keep as many as you want. So what is a possession limit? So a possession limit, almost every state is the exact same in the way it defines a possession limit. Uh, it's two times the daily bag limit, but that does not include the fish that you have processed at your house. So if you take a flathead home that's 38 inches and you process it, it no longer counts towards your possession limit. So you, let's say you fish two days in a row and you catch one two days in a row, right? So now you've got two, you are at your maximum possession limit. So you've got to either take one of those home and flay it out and put it in the freezer or uh, both of them or you're, you're done keeping flatheads, right? That's what that is. So it's two times the daily bag limit. In lakes, however, and this is something you guys really need to pay attention to because sometimes a lot of your states distinguish between lakes and rivers, right? So, and I believe in my state that the whole one over 35 remains the same. However, there's no minimum size limit, but there is a maximum number you can keep under 35 inches and that is 10. And that's true for all catfish. All, pretty much all catfish in my state are treated with the exact same legislation. The only difference is it's, it's kind of, it's like a trophy max limit, bag limit, where you can only keep one of a trophy fish of either a blue or a flathead, and they can only be 35 inches. And channel cat is 28 inches. You can only keep one over that. So be mindful of that. Some of your states will have different rules for lakes and, and rivers, or sometimes even specific, very specific laws about specific lakes. For example, Lake Winnebago, Bago, Bago, I don't know, in Wisconsin, actually has a season, and I believe that flathead season opens up May the 7th and closes September 30th on that lake in Wisconsin, right? And there's, there's other places that I found too, but I just, for reference, I wanted you to, to be mindful of that. How many poles can you have? That's a big one. Uh, I don't think it's, it's really ticketed that much, but I'd say it's one of those laws that's broken often. Uh, in my state, you can have three. You can have three poles in the water fishing at one time. It doesn't matter what you're fishing for. You can have a flathead rod, a channel cat rod, and a crappie rod. Uh, you can't have any more than that. And you can't, you know, try and catch skipjack at the same time. Nope. You got to pull one of those out of the water to fish for skipjack, to catch more bait, whatever. So let's move to the meat and potatoes of this video, the one that I really wanted to get into, the one that I have to be mindful of constantly. And that is, it really like, ultimately determines what I end up doing that day most of the time and that is bait laws right so like there's I could go get any bait I wanted anytime I wanted if I never wanted to have a problem with bait and the law wasn't an issue for me I would never worry about bait uh, but unfortunately we live in a world where we have laws about bait so we got to got to talk about them and it changes a little bit of the way I do things so this is probably the one piece of legislation that I've read over more than any other, just because I, I, it's just a constant fight. It's a constant battle. Bait is a constant battle. It is illegal to possess for any reason a game fish that does not meet the bag limits or size limits indicated for that species. Any legally caught fish may be used as bait. However, it is illegal to use live carp or gizzard chat for bait. So, my state is, is actually pretty lackluster 
Uh, I really don't like the fact that I can't use live carp for bait. Um, I think they should be a little bit more specific on that because live common carp are one of the best baits you can find for flatheads. And they're a naturalized species. And I understand it's just too dangerous to just willy-nilly allow people to use them whenever, wherever. I think if you catch that carp in that body of water, you can use it for bait alive in that body of water. But according to the law, you can't. I also think about gizzard chat. Uh, it very clearly stated in there that you're not allowed to use live gizzard, gizzard chat for bait. That's not true. Uh, it's really funny how the law is written because when, as you go further down the line, it will say, oh, but you can use live gizzard chat here, 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 here. And so there is actually places in Indiana where you can do that. What you can't do is catch live gizzard chat, absolutely not, and transport them somewhere else alive. You can't do that. Another thing that you can't do is you can't catch you can't use a seine net cast net any type of passive fishing method or any nets or traps uh, i believe it's 500 yards below a dam maybe 300 but i think it's 500 yards below a dam so the gist of all that is as long as it's legal to keep and it was caught legally i.e in other words a rod and reel then you can use it for bait as long like for example there's a reverse slot limit uh, on largemouth bass in my state that's 12 to 15 inches you can't keep any of those out of a river in my state you can't so that means an 11 and a half inch bass that's bait baby a 15 and a half inch bass it's bait live bait now you want to be careful in some of your states bait fish have to remain whole such as things like game fish and stuff they do allow you to use them but you got to use them whole right that's my state doesn't care but some states will care and the reason why they care is because they cannot accurately measure that fish once you've cut its head off for example uh, which is understandable. I think it's foolish, but that's the law. Some states don't allow goldfish, mine do. So that's another one you need to be mindful of. Uh, goldfish are very popular bait fish to be used all over the United States, but there's a lot of places that don't allow to use them. And there's a lot of individual lakes that you need to be mindful of that make sure that if you're gonna take goldfish for bait, you need to look into it because some of those lakes won't allow you to use goldfish. I'm also not allowed to technically dump my bait buckets back into the water at the end of the day. Uh, only if you caught that bait in that body of water can you do that. If you catch your bait out of a pond or a lake and take it to the river, you cannot dump your bait, bait, your bait tank, bait bucket, whatever, back into the water. You can't do that. Illegal devices. I don't even know why I added this one, but most of this should be a no-brainer. So in my state, it is illegal to use the following devices to take fish in public water. A weir. Is a weir. A weir or a low head dam is a barrier across the width of a river that alters the flow characteristics of water and usually results in a change in height of the river level. That's awesome. So weirs are bad, stay away from those. And if you like added a consonant into that, that would have like a whole new meaning to that sentence. Okay, so you can't use electric current, you can't use dynamite, you can't use uh, firearms, you can't use hands alone. You, Hands alone, that's a big one. In my state, you can't noodle for fish. You can't do it. You're not allowed to do that in my state. Unfortunate. Not for me. I really don't care. I hate noodling. I think it's dumb. Uh, I think it's, I don't think it's good for the fish. I'm just against it. I, I just disagree with it uh, personally. I don't think you should be allowed to do it, but what I think you should and shouldn't do really doesn't matter. So just for me personally, I'll never do it. I don't see like, to me it just doesn't look like there's any fun to have there and i really don't like what it does to the fish oh and you can't poison them either so that's another one you can't do kind of no-brainer type stuff except for the hands one you can't a lot of people are allowed to noodle in their state i'm not sorting fish this is another one uh so sorting fish basically means if you catch your limit right and then you catch a bigger fish as your sixth fish let's say you can keep let's say you can keep five of something right so that you catch a six fish, but it's bigger than half of your other ones, you can throw one of your little ones back as long as it's alive and in good health, right? And, and as long as it's capable of swimming off, then you can actually trade those fish out. My state allows you to do that. But a lot of your states, they don't allow you to do that. 
We're gonna cover another one here. It's called the wanton waste law. So I see this one probably broken more than any other one uh, personally, or maybe I just used to see, like maybe it's because I'm looking for it, but you're not allowed to waste wildlife, right? The wanton waste law is also a federal law, but every state has its own version of it and they're all pretty much the exact same. You cannot kill any living wild animal and just leave it for no purpose at all, right? So you can't catch a bowfin and throw it up on the bank, even though hundreds of, maybe even thousands of people do that every year. And the same with gar. You cannot take these fish out of the water and throw them up on the bank for no reason other than just because you don't like them. If you don't like them, then eat them. It's pretty simple. I used to have a gar catching cook on my channel, but uh, YouTube put the nicks on that one. So I hope this video helps you guys out a lot, especially if you're new to flathead fishing. There's a whole lot more to fishing than just taking a bait and throwing it in the water. You need to make sure that you're compliant with the law, right? You need to make sure that your bait is okay. Uh, you're allowed to use it. You're allowed to have it there. You need to make sure that where you're sitting is not on private property that you don't have permission. Uh, you also need to make sure that if you're going to keep some fish, you know what those standards are. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you got something out of it. I hope this thing works so I don't have to record it for a third time. And if I do, it doesn't matter what I say because you're never going to see this video. Stay tuned for the next one. Well, it may be the next one. Maybe the next one or the one after the next one. Uh, but a 2019 krill report came out for an area very close to where I fish. It's almost the exact same place that I fish. And so I'm super excited to share those findings with you guys. Until next time, go have fun fishing. <laughs>